Well, good morning again. We're going to pick up in Acts chapter 12, where we left off last week. Uh, We're also going to look at uh, an account, an event that takes place that that Dan mentioned in his class last week. I always love it when there are connections between um, the different teachers and what we're studying together. And as we've made our way through this story of Acts, hopefully um, the experience of these early followers of Jesus is helping strengthen our faith in, in the midst of what we're struggling with. And help us, I hope it's helped us to focus again on the reality of the mission that we are called to pursue um, as we're working for reconciliation and peace Uh, seeking to extend forgiveness of sin to those around us, um, to be reminded again what it is to be part of the church. And I think um, that while we're all having to deal with that individually, hopefully when we come back together and assemble again as the called out, uh, we will be able to rejoice and commit ourselves again to that ministry that Christ has called us to. There are times when we need that reminder because it's pretty easy to get uh, sidetracked and to forget uh, what it is to be part of this incredible thing uh, called the kingdom of God, to be a participant, um, an ambassador, an emissary uh, for Jesus, Um, just as uh, Peter and Paul and all of those that we read about in this story, that they were called to be ambassadors for the kingdom of God. And I want us to, to notice, um, right where we left off, this, this enlarging of the kingdom of God is really what's taking place in Acts uh, chapters 9, 10, and 11, and into 12, this, this uh, kingdom of God is, is beginning to swell um, as Gentiles are now included into the, the church. And this um, small group from Jerusalem has, has been pushed out through persecution it's now um, bubbling up across the Roman Empire, and there's a lot of, of suffering that begins to take place. And there's this moment where Paul and Barnabas are going to take back a gift to strengthen the believers. And that all sets the stage for this as we get to look at one of my favorite moments recorded in Acts chapter 12. It was about this time that King Herod arrested some who belonged to the church, intending to persecute them. He had James, the brother of John, put to death with the sword. When he saw that this pleased the Jews, he proceeded to seize Peter also. This happened during the Feast of Unleavened Bread. After arresting him, he put him in prison, handed him over to be guarded by four squads of four soldiers each. Herod intended to bring him out for a public trial after the Passover. So Peter was kept in prison, but the church was earnestly praying to God for him. Now, if you know this story, this one always was one of my favorites when when the flannel graph would come out. This story of Peter in prison. And if you already jump to the end, you're going to miss something that's taking place. Because I, I really love how the church is anxious, believing, I I think with good reason, that Peter is about to suffer the same fate that James um, has, that he is going to be killed for his faith in Jesus. And they gather together, and they begin to pray for Peter. And so we get to jump into this story because there's something that happens here that I really want us to pay attention to. The night before Herod was to bring him to trial... Peter was sleeping between two soldiers, bound with chains, and sentries stood guard at the entrance. Suddenly, an angel of the Lord appeared, and a light shone in the cell. He struck Peter on the side and woke him up. Quick, get up, he said, and the chains fell off Peter's wrists. Then the angel said to him, put on your clothes and sandals, and Peter did so. Wrap your cloak around you and follow me, the angel told him. Peter followed him out of the prison, but he had no idea that what the angel was doing was really happening. He thought he was seeing a vision. They passed the first and second guards, 
and came to the iron gate leading to the city. It opened for them by itself, and they went through it. When they had walked the length of one street, suddenly the angel left him. Then Peter came to himself and said, Now I know without a doubt that the Lord sent his angel and rescued me from Herod's clutches and from everything the Jewish people were anticipating. When this had dawned on him, he went to the house of Mary, the mother of John, also called Mark, where many people had gathered and were praying. Peter knocked at the outer entrance, and a servant girl named Rhoda came to answer the door. When she recognized Peter's voice, she was overjoyed and ran back without opening it, exclaiming, Peter is at the door. You're out of your mind, they told her. When she kept insisting that it was so, they said, it must be his angel. But Peter kept on knocking, and when they opened the door and saw him, they were astonished. Peter motioned with his hands for them to be quiet and described how the Lord had brought him out of prison. Tell James and the brothers about this, he said, and then he left for another place. Now, there are several things I want to make sure that we notice. And I I always find every time I read this story, how interesting it is that Peter, um, a guy who by this point in his life has seen some amazing things, Um, and witnessed the miracles of of God, uh, participated in the healing and even uh, raising people from the dead, um, doesn't realize this is actually happening. It's almost as if the circumstances of his life, the reality of this situation, that he is in prison anticipating a trial tomorrow and probably a, a quick execution, that that's the reality that's happening for him. And so he can't see and understand what God is really doing as this angel appears to release him. And contrasting that as well, the inability of the brothers and sisters gathered together, the church assembled to pray for a miracle of God that they can't believe one actually will come. Because when it does come, they don't believe it. And then I remember just as we've said all, as, all along as we've gone through the story of God's people in the book of Acts, they are exactly like us. Um, their faith, well, it's so easy for us to say that our faith would be more if we had seen the things that these people had seen. They struggle just like we do. In the circumstances of their life, it is easier to not believe, to not understand, to not see, than it is to have a confidence, an assurance that God's plan is actually being worked out. And so this remarkable moment happens in Scripture where God is not done with Peter, and so he is released from Herod's prison. And I want to finish reading this story because there's one thing that I think really, it it always sticks with me. In the morning, there was no small commotion among the soldiers as to what had become of Peter. That is a huge understatement. Can you imagine? The chains are there. The guards that he was chained to are there. The guards that were standing guard at the door are there. Uh, There's a whole company of soldiers assigned, and they can't find him. After Herod had a thorough search made for him and did not find him, he cross-examined the guards and ordered that they be executed. Then Herod went from Judea to Caesarea and stayed there a while. He had been quarreling with the people of Tyre and Sidon. They now joined together and sought an audience with him. Having secured the support of Blastus, a trusted personal servant of the king, they asked for peace because they depended on the king's country for their food supply. On the appointed day, Herod, wearing his royal robe, sat on his throne and delivered a public address to the people. They shouted, This is the voice of a god, not of a man. Immediately, because Herod did not give praise to God, an angel of the Lord struck him down, and he was eaten by worms and died. But the word of God continued to increase and spread. Now, 
the part that always sticks out to me is this weird little moment. Have you ever had to wake your kids up? David, you're here. Have you ever had to wake up? Which one of your kids sleeps the hardest? Theo. Mine is Cole. That boy can sleep. And sometimes I've had to to rouse him, shake him. I would not entertain the idea of striking him, though, while he sleeps. And yet that that is the word that's used to describe what the angel does to Peter. He strikes him on the side. That word can mean a couple of different things. It can mean to hit, to strike, or to kill. And in fact, that word appears twice in our text that we just read. Once, as the angel strikes Peter to wake him up, and the angel that strikes Herod and causes him to die. Same word. And it draws my attention to this reality. God is powerful to save. And the way he does it, we can't really understand. He stretches out his hand and acts through this angel sent to release Peter and, and rouses Peter from his sleep and takes him right out past the guards, opens the iron gate for him to enter the city, leads him right to safety with the believers. And at the same time, God rescues believers from Herod, who may have acted again further, that he punishes Herod and saves God's people. And this contrast is presented in this text that this leader who wants to persecute the church and these Jewish leaders who are taking great joy in the fact that Herod is willing to persecute the followers of Jesus is struck down. And it says because he doesn't give glory to God, but I would have to guess that, Greg, are you with me? I don't think Herod ever gave glory to God. It's not just this one moment or these people trying to appease some great leader saying, he has the voice of a God. No, Herod's entire life, he hasn't glorified God. And the purposes of God are about to be carried out. And so Herod is punished. And it's the same reason that Peter is rescued from prison. The purposes of God are about to be carried out. And the text that Greg read to us as we started that God is who God is, and God is going to do what God is going to do, and His plans are going to be carried out, and He has the authority and the power and the ability to do all of that, whether we participate or not. And the question becomes, are we willing to participate? Do we want to join in what God is doing? And we're most inclined to not join in what God is doing when one of two things enter our life either exceeding comfort or exceeding hardship. And maybe that's why we're sometimes called lukewarm, because we just, we can't have it too good. We forget the purposes of God and participating with what He's doing. And if we have too much suffering, we seem to forget and struggle to participate with what God is doing. And I don't know what moment you're living in, but it seems to me that in the context of our life right now, we have an awful lot of suffering, an awful lot of hardship that we're having to go through. And I wonder if, just as we talked last week, if we have the ability to see what God is doing and to trust in His ability to carry out His plan. Because you see, God is going to strike a blow. He is going to defeat, ultimately, sin and death. He is going to present the truth of who Jesus is. It it is what he is going to do. And we have the opportunity to participate. And we can struggle if, if we allow hardship and persecution to pull us away from the purposes of God, if if our faith can be uh, challenged to a point where we won't see. And I love that Peter in this text references James and, and the other leaders because it's James who who writes some words for us that I think that we can hold on to in the midst of this, that 
that we know that trial and persecution are going to come, but that when we hold fast, that we will overcome. And that we're invited to remember that we're going to receive a crown, a blessing from God because of it. And, and I think James is trying to mirror the words of his brother Jesus as he reminds us again of the words we read last week from the Sermon on the Mount, that God intends to bless us when we're persecuted, that when we're willing to stand the test for him, that he intends to bring a blessing to us. And we are not promised that life here will be without uh, suffering. In fact, we're promised that it will have suffering. But that those of us who understand, like Peter did, that he begins to learn over the course of his life that whether it's um, persecution or suffering that comes into his life, that the purposes of God are going to be fulfilled. And so when Peter writes his letter to the church and he extends some words to them, I want us to put those in, in the context of Peter's life and what he has experienced because he has a word of encouragement to give us that it would be remarkable to think that Peter stands outside the door asking the church to believe he's been rescued by God and to spread that good news. And so even when Peter is arrested again and he writes these words to the church, he invites them to believe that there is something grander, something bolder, a mission of God that is being pursued. And we're invited to believe that even in the moment that we're living through. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade, kept in heaven for us, who through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of the salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while you may have to have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. These have come so that your faith of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, may be proved genuine and may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. Though you have not seen him, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy for you are receiving the goal of your faith, the salvation of your souls. You see, ultimately, the enemies of God will be defeated, whether they're presented as King Herod, or if they're presented as a virus, or they're presented as the strife that exists between those who should call one another brother. The enemies of God will ultimately be defeated, and in this moment, we're invited to believe that we can jump into the story and be in the midst of that prayer meeting, praying for God's will to be done. But we can still struggle to believe that it's happening. We can be like Peter and be confused by the circumstances around us. But I want to encourage us today as we participate in taking the Lord's Supper again, that we remember that this memorial is a victory celebration. While it's easy for us to suffer, for us to focus on the suffering, we're invited to focus on the ultimate victory, the new birth that we have received in the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. That as we take the bread and the cup, we participate in an eternal truth that God cannot be defeated and that he is victorious and that he defeats everything that stands opposed to his people in his time. And that the time is growing short before Christ will ultimately be revealed for who he is. Would you pray with me? Father, we thank you for the gift of Jesus, the reminder that we can participate again this week in taking um, the bread and the cup and remembering the death and the resurrection of our Lord, that we are acclaimed people, that we are empowered by your spirit to pursue your purposes. And we pray that in each one of us, as we take this reminder again this week, that you would help us to dedicate our, ourselves to your purpose, to the expansion of your kingdom, the revelation of your glory, and that we would give you the glory that you deserve. Help us in all things to glorify you. 
It's in the name of Christ we pray. Amen.